Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our CSIS event on regulating the European tech sovereignty. Uh, this is the uh, culmination of a, of a project that the Scholl Chair has undertaken <clears throat> beginning a number of months ago, looking at EU regulatory policies in, in the digital space, particularly focusing on uh, artificial intelligence or AI, uh, the proposed Digital Services Act, now the Digital Markets Act uh, as well, and also uh, EU work on, on, on competition policy. We've been looking at, at all of those. Uh, I think one of the interesting developments in, in recent years has been the, the EU's discovery that, that uh, you can have a first mover advantage in the regulatory field. Um, and that uh, if you act quickly and, and, and uh, effectively uh, and nobody else has alternatives, you become the, the sort of the default regulator um, and for technologies like uh, digital, which really are global technologies, uh, that has uh, enormous implications. It has a lot of implications for everybody. Uh, and uh, it's, that is what in particular we wanted to look at. So what we have done is to study the impact of the EU regulatory approaches in those three areas on uh, business in the European Union and also business here in the United States. So we have looked at it from, from uh, two different angles. And as you can see on the, uh, the slide there, we have produced a, a number of papers so far. And um, hold on a minute, I need to get to... Um, here we are. On those papers, um, Uh, here we are. We've published two commentaries on the EU's digital regulatory landscape and transatlantic data flows, as well as a short piece on the regulation of AI by Congress and the European Commission. We've also published two short commentaries, as well as a longer white paper that describe competition policies and antitrust regulation in the EU and the implications for US businesses. And this morning, we released the last item on, on the slide that you can see, which is a white paper on the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. All of these publications may be found on the Scholl Chair website, and the link to the most recent uh, paper, the DSA and DMA paper, can also be found on the web uh, webpage for this, this event. Uh, this link is also going to be posted in the Zoom chat for this event, and I would encourage all of you to, uh, to uh, get a hold of these papers and take a look at them. Uh, <clears throat> we also are sensitive to the fact that uh, the EU has not finished its work and the proposals that uh, we're gonna be discussing today and that we discuss in the paper are, are not final and are in fact evolving. Uh, we thought it was important to be part of the comment uh, period while all this was going on, but it's our hope at a later date once there is a final uh, uh, set of proposals uh, to do another one of these events, at which time we'll have uh, uh, some people from the, uh, hopefully from the commission that were responsible for the product uh, to come and tell us about it, as well as to have people commenting about it. Today, uh, we just have uh, commentators. Uh, and to that end, I want to uh, begin, we can take the slide down now, please. I want to begin with <clears throat> introducing our keynote speaker, who is, it's a real pleasure to have him, to have him with us. He's, uh, uh, Michael Froman, who is currently the Vice Chairman and President for Strategic Growth at MasterCard, but uh, I think most of you know him as the United States Trade Representative uh, in the Obama administration, uh, where he did, a, I, in my view anyway, a superb job of trying to uh, uh, square the circle on some very difficult trade issues, including TPP, uh, which uh, he successfully concluded uh, only to have uh, his, the next president uh, leave, leave it on his third day in office. Uh, 
hopefully that will come full circle and we'll find a way to get back to it. But that's not today's topic. Today's topic is Europe and digital trade, which is uh, very much in, in Mike's wheelhouse, both because of his USTR experience, but also because of his current position at, at, uh, at MasterCard. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to the ambassador to talk and he's on a fairly tight schedule. So he's gonna make remarks and then, and, and then leave us. And then we've got a panel of experts uh, and which you've, uh, I, I think you saw on the, on the notice for the event. And I will introduce them uh, after the ambassador is finished. So with that, I turn it over to you, Mike, go ahead. Well, thanks, Bill, very much for having me. And uh, I apologize, I can't stay for the, the panel, but this really is a terrific body of work that, that you and your colleagues are producing and advancing the discussion. And I was thinking back that I have been going to conferences around the issue of transatlantic tensions or crisis since 1985. Um, uh, first it was over arms control and the intermediate nuclear forces issues, and then it was over Balkans, then it was the Iraq invasion. Um, it just seems like there's a perpetual uh, concern about the transatlantic relationship. And it's not just historical. Just yesterday, the EU imposed $4 billion of tariffs on U.S. products in response to the Boeing Airbus decision in reaction to the U.S. having imposed $7 billion in the same case. There are individual countries considering imposing a digital services tax on uh, com companies, largely American companies, and lots of saber rattling around that. The fact is U.S. and Europe together have built an integrated, relatively open, rules-based global economy over the last several decades that has resulted in unprecedented and peaceful growth for a long time and has been based on a number of shared principles, values, and goals. And that system has come under stress over the last several years. Uh, that stress pre-existed this administration, it pre-existed COVID, but as in the case in so many other areas, those factors I think accelerated some trends that were already underway and have shown a bright light on some of the strengths and weaknesses of the system. The question is what to do at this stage, and particularly on these sets of issues, these emerging issues around technology and the digital economy, which could either be a great opportunity for the US and the EU to come together and, and cooperate, or it could become a new source of tension and the source of many more conferences on transatlantic uh, crises. So let me start first with areas of common interest. Uh, the US and the EU are still at the heart of the liberal market-oriented democratic rules-based order. And even though we have seen illiberal elements emerge on both sides of the Atlantic, frankly, uh, we have a common interest in strengthening that rules-based system and that embodies those values. First, the US and the EU have think have a common interest in determining how best to integrate an economy as big and as important as China into the global rules-based system when it follows a fundamentally different set of rules. And to work together on issues like non-commercial technology transfers, the impact of state-owned enterprises and subsidies and their distortive effect on global trade, the protection of intellectual property rights, uh, ensuring, ensuring reciprocal and fair market access, those are all issues that we have very much in common. We may have differences over the tactics used to assert those uh, interests. Uh, there was no great enthusiasm in Europe for the US use of tariffs over the last uh, few years, but that has not stopped the US, the EU, Japan, and others from coming together to talk about a common approach uh, to, some of these, uh, to some of these issues. And whatever our differences are between the US and EU over technology policy, data policy, privacy, digital economy issues, uh, those differences are much smaller. We have much more in common vis-a-vis -vis the alternative set of frameworks that China might put forward in those same set of areas. And we have a common interest in coming together to bridge those differences and uh, advocate jointly for them with China and other parties. Uh, secondly, we, can, we should work together to help figure out the right balance between innovation and regulation. Um, I don't have to explain to this audience the importance of data, not just for high-tech digital platform companies, but really across all of our services sector and increasingly in our manufacturing sector. 
uh, European manufacturers of automobiles and aircraft depend on real-time access to global data, EU small businesses uh, of all types leverage technology platforms and the data associated with that to reach customers in other markets. It's becoming a ubiquitous part of every, uh, of every business. Um, and you know, the, the, because of that, and because of the importance that data plays, uh, it plays and will only increasingly play, it underscores the importance of getting privacy regulation right. Uh, and I think Bill, as he said in his introduction, cited the EU's first mover advantage as a privacy uh, regulator and with GDPR. And um, while the EU, I think, has successfully been out there with GDPR in a way that has influenced other jurisdictions, including uh, in the in the United States, we see the California law as an example. Um, there is still work to be done to have a comprehensive federal strategy and law on on privacy. But one should not conflate privacy regulation with data localization or digital protectionism. Uh, there's a natural tendency of governments to say, this is important, I need to control it. And there are many ways to protect individuals' personal information without sacrificing the benefits of cross-border data flows and, and while at the same time allowing for the innovation that comes with the digital economy. And I will give you one example, and of course it's a parochial example of my own company, where we live by a set of data responsibility principles that if you're an individual, you own your data, you control your data, you should benefit from your data, and it's our job to protect your data. In Europe, we have a joint venture with IBM that is completely GDPR compliant that allows us to do the kind of data analytics that add value and innovation uh, to the economy. And more generally, when we look around the world, because we're able to see data flows across borders that are anonymized, aggregated, no personal information, we're able to spot patterns of cyber intrusions and other anomalies, which has allowed us to save countries $55 billion over the last few years in what potentially could have been cyber theft. If you see balkanized internets, national clouds, data localization requirements, it makes those sorts of insights much more difficult to create and it destroys value. And so my main point here is yes, on privacy, it's absolutely critically important. It's a first order issue. And at the same time, let's figure out how to address legitimate privacy concerns, as I think is very much possible without sacrificing the benefits of an open digital economy. Third, I think we should work together to forge a technology alliance of sorts to establish principles as a way to guide digital policy and collaboration. Um, we're not particularly well organized domestically in the US government to deal with these issues. Is this a trade issue, a finance issue, an industrial policy issue? Where does it sit in the US government? Internationally, similarly, is this a G7, a G20, a WTO issue? Is it left for bilateral forums? It would be useful to bring together countries and entities that have a shared interest in promoting openness and innovation while ensuring adequate and appropriate safeguards. And I use as an example, the Financial Stability Board that was created after the global financial crisis, not because we're in a crisis right now, but because we want to avoid one. It's not necessarily to create regulation, but rather to facilitate bilateral and international cooperation and coordination on digital and technology related issues and address the proliferation of overlapping or conflicting measures. And the goal could well be that to enhance the cooperation among national authorities to agree on certain taxonomies and policy principles and regulatory approaches, all with an eye towards facilitating international cooperation, data connectivity and commercial interoperability. It might not be realistic to think we could come up with one single common set of global standards for every issue, but we should at least be able to ensure that there is interoperability among different standards that might emerge. Fourth, and let me come back, and uh, this will be my last, uh, uh, my, my last point uh, to the transatlantic relationship. I think when it comes to these new emerging issues, the watchword ought to be the Hippocratic Oath, uh, do no harm. Uh, there's been much talk uh, uh, in the EU about digital sovereignty. Uh, some US tech firms have felt that between privacy and data regulations, antitrust investigations, and tax initiatives, they are being singled out 
and that Europe, which has had challenges creating a ecosystem that is, can give rise to digital innovation, has focused instead on trying to bring them down. Let me be clear. Every country, every entity has a legitimate interest in protecting privacy, in uh, managing their fiscal policy, in ensuring a competitive economy. Um, and every country and entity has a legitimate interest in trying to further its strength in key technologies and key sectors. It's a natural thing for governments to do. The question is how they go about doing it and at what cost to other interests. Uh, I've already touched upon issues like privacy and how to deal with privacy without sacrificing the benefits of an open digital economy. I think it will be critically important that the EU's digital sovereignty notion doesn't become the European equivalent of China 2025 or the self-reliance component of its new dual circulation model. Uh, rather, we should look for ways to strengthen the transatlantic uh, relationship and integrate our economies. We already have the largest bilateral trade and investment relationship in the world. I, I'm not here to talk about TTIP, thankfully, uh, but we all know that there are long and historic differences between us, uh, cheese names, among other issues. Uh, but when it comes to the digital economy, there are considerable differences in how we view these issues right now. And this is the right time to try and bring the two sides together to see where we might have common ground. Uh, that could mean the establishment of a trade and technology bilateral dialogue uh, between the US and the EU that would allow for engagement on these digital trade matters of interest to each other and allow more open ways of dealing with them, uh, whether it's bilaterally or through some sort of alliance around, uh, broader alliance around technology. Um, and I would just cite the, the data and the digital economy provisions that began in TPP, found their way into USMCA and were somewhat enhanced in USMCA, um, are now part of other trade negotiations going on um, uh, as well. But that having the two sides sit down and talk about uh, those principles as a starting point for uh, resolving our, our differences would be a, a positive step forward. And then finally, of course, the US and the EU should work together where possible to further this agenda through other organizations, whether it's the WTO uh, or the OECD. I think there is now widespread agreement on the need for reform of the WTO to, and, and to not just deal with the public body issues, but to deal with the fact that uh, services generally are um, not dealt with nearly as robustly as uh, goods and that there is a lot more, it's becoming an increasingly important part of the, uh, uh, the global economy, services, e-commerce, digital issues to make progress wherever we can, uh, whether it's bilaterally through some new alliance on technology uh, or through institutions like the WTO um, or, uh, or the OECD, which I imagine will be the subject of further CSIS programs as well. With that, Bill, I will stop. Well, thank you very much. That was just uh, an excellent beginning because you touched on a lot of the themes that we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about. And uh, I very much appreciate uh, your, your giving us the time, Mike, and we'll, we'll let you go because I know you have another meeting. And we'll get on to the, uh, the panel, which I think will pick up on, on, on some of your themes. Uh, clearly, uh, you had a, a, a wonderful well, little uh, piece of history. This has been a complicated relationship between Europe and the United States for a very long time, uh, often uh, uh, you know, uh, focused on, on specific things. You mentioned cheese and, and, na uh, and names. Uh, my personal favorite is chickens. And those of you that are uh, on this, in this meeting that uh, you may have heard me rant about chickens in the past. And, uh, that's not a big issue in the digital space. So I'm not gonna talk about chickens today, but. Uh, we've been talking about some of these issues uh, amongst ourselves for 30, 40 years and, and made very little progress. Uh, this topic is a little bit different in the sense that uh, you know, digital uh, trade, digital uh, communication uh, is inherently a global technology, you know, and, and uh, stuff flows across borders instantaneously and amorphously. It's not like you can go to the dock and you know, uh, watch your uh, bits and bytes unload, at, uh, at, uh, you know, in, in some container. Uh, money is being transferred with a few clicks. 
uh, technology is being transferred uh, with a few clicks and data is being transferred as, as we've talked about. It's inherently global, which really uh, makes a compelling case for a much more of a global approach to addressing uh, all the problems that are associated with it. And we find ourselves though in a world where, where this seems to be fragmenting. We have the Chinese taking a, a very different approach from both of us, an approach that is much more state dominated where privacy is not really uh, a value that they, at least as far in terms of, of keeping things private from the state uh, is not a value and, and where control of, of, of technology and citizens access to technology is approached very differently than it is in either the Europe, Europe or the United States. But it's also clear, I think, from, from uh, Ambassador Froman's comments and from what we're going to be talking about now, that there are significant differences between uh, the way that Europe approaches some of these issues uh, and the way that, that, that we in the United States approach some of these issues as well. And that's what we want to tease out uh, uh, with our panel. And I want to introduce them now. Um, uh, along with uh, Meredith Broadbent, who is uh, really the, the, uh, the uh, instigator of this project, if you will, and she, she's going to lead the conversation after our panelists uh, get done. We've invited our, our speakers today because each of them has expertise uh, in the whole thing, but in particular in, in one of the areas that we researched on. So I think we've invited them all to speak uh, broadly about the uh, <clears throat> the digital trade issues that, that divide us, but I, I think you're going to hear particular comments about AI or about the DSA or about competition policy from uh, from each of them because they are, have spent particular uh, amounts of time uh, studying those particular things. And then in our questions and hopefully your questions, uh, we'll be able to weave all this together at the end. So our panelists, and I'm going to introduce them uh, now in the order in which they'll be speaking, uh, and then we'll go directly to them. The first is Benedict Bromeyer, who is the director of EU policy at Ally for Startups. Ally for Startups is a worldwide network of over 40 advocacy organizations in three continents that focuses on improving the policy environment uh, for startups. So uh, he is going to be uh, talking in particular about uh, about AI. Next, we're going to have Eliana Garces, who is the Director of Economic Policy at Facebook, a company that I suspect you have all heard of. Uh, previously, she was an economist at the Brattle Group, but also spent four years on the staff of uh, then uh, EU Vice President and uh, Competition Policy Commissioner, uh, Joaquina Munya, in between 2010 and 2014, uh, where she worked on competition policy for the for the EU. Third is uh, Kai Uwe Kuhn, who is a professor of economics at the University of East Anglia and an academic consultant with the Battle, Battle Group, and also has uh, visiting appointments at the Dusseldorf Institute for Competition Economics and also at Georgetown University. He has in the past been uh, the chief economist at DB Competition for the European Commission, so he has a significant experience in the uh, competition policy field. And finally, uh, we have our own Kati Zomanen, who is one of the, is the principal author on our competition policy papers that are on the slide I showed you earlier, who is the founder and CEO of Next, Next Trade Group, which helps multilateral development banks, governments, and Fortune 500 companies optimize public policies and investments. She's also an adjunct fellow with the CSIS uh, Europe program and is uh, a good friend of our organization and a frequent contributor to our work. So that's the panel, a uh, high degree of expertise, and we'll go directly to Benedict. Go ahead. Good afternoon from Brussels. Um, thanks to uh, Bill and CSIS for, for giving us the opportunity to share. Um, it's good also for me to be back virtually, at least in the town I enjoyed studying in. Um, thanks for introducing um, AFS. I feel I can skip any introductions about us um, and get right to the topic. Um, when talking about regulating for European tech um, sovereignty and AI in particular, I have to start with the caveat that how do we define sovereignty is still uh, not entirely clear here in Brussels. Um, if you put 10 Eurocrats or policy nerds like myself in a room 
and ask them to define it, you're probably still likely to get 15 definitions. So, uh, and this includes in the European Commission, where um, you know you one might argue that even between Vice President Vestager and Breton um, and Commissioner Breton, there is not necessarily a uniform a uniform view yet. Um, now, from our position at Anet for Startups, um, we believe that at best EU tech sovereignty should be about building the framework to allow more startups to get founded, to be competitive and to scale up and challenge incumbents. And we don't think that this is achieved by building barriers, shutting off the European continent or preventing data flows as, as Ambassador Froman said before, or, um, um, or data localization measures. Um, so I think the framing of this, this discussion is, is really fitting because we need to take a broad view and understand that the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, competition, data governance is one we haven't mentioned yet, are all puzzle pieces in this story around achieving digital sovereignty. And, and potential AI legislation should also be seen uh, uh, through this lens. And in Europe, we're coming from a position where the EU leadership realizes that uh, the US and China have perhaps moved faster on AI. And, and now EU leadership, uh, the EU leadership is considering how to give impulses to uh, initiate a catch up. And in that process, um, the EU, as, as Bill said at the outset, is known as and likes to think of itself as a standard setter for the rest of the world, as the example of GDPR has shown. So, so cutting a long story short, um, the idea here with uh, European AI legislation is to, is to provide a common European set of principles that provides a harmonized framework uh, for all AI players to, to operate with. Um, and while we're at it, uh, so to speak, to identify and build protections against any potential risks AI could cause. Um, and as Bill said, who knows where else this will be adopted around the world. Um, so, so maybe just giving a, a quick recap where we're coming from here um, and what we're looking at. I think the EU's AI white paper is still the central point of reference uh, when we're talking about EU AI uh, legislation. And um, just briefly, this sets out two components in building an ecosystem of excellence and building an ecosystem of trust. Um, building an ecosystem of excellence is about supporting AI research, supporting AI deployment, AI uptake, setting incentives, also in including putting 21 billion euros in funding into this making sure that public procurement is going to startups. Most of these measures are about building, building the ecosystem and we would find ourselves being supportive of these. Um, I think we'll probably be spending more time discussing how to legislate for an ecosystem of trust. Um, and, and what we do know here is that the European Commission is looking at a sort of risk-based approach um, that will identify low and high risk AI applications and um, look to make proportional rules for them accordingly. Now, as you can tell already, the definition of high risk, I think is going to be a key bone of contention. Um, as of today, we can assume that the commission is working on a, a two part definition, um, which consists of if your application is in a high risk sector and what the intended use of the AI application is. Um, so basically for the AI uh, developers out there, the question boils down to, um, does the use of AI involve risks for human health, consumer safety, or fundamental rights? Um, if yes, your startup or business is likely, uh, you know, is classified as high risk, you can expect things like ex ante requirements um, for your business, like, like auditing the data that you use to train your algorithms just as an example, before entering the EU market. Um, and we can also expect new liability rules for AI-based products or services. Now, I'd like to just give three quick observations on this from our perspective. Um, in general, as a startup organization, we're incredibly enthusiastic about the potential for artificial intelligence, also for our green and digital recovery in Europe. Um, but we also believe that it's, it's very hard to know where this breakthrough technology is leading so um, I find myself agreeing with Ambassador Fruman that I think we should really make sure not to do any harm first. Um, and we shouldn't tell ourselves that we can build an ecosystem just by legislating for it. And, and I, just to double down on that, um, when, when looking at whether to regulate AI in, in Europe, we believe the hurdle should be um, whether we have proof of an additional risk 
hosted by an AI-based product that is not covered in existing EU legislation because we have GDPR, we have a product liability directive, which is actually going to be reviewed soon and other laws. So I think there, there has to be a, you know, a hurdle to clear first. And I think the worst case scenario also in the digital trade context would be adding another broad heavy handed layer of legislation that, that de facto encourages AI startups to look to other geographies to expand. Second uh, thought would be that if we then decide to uh, go down the path of regulating AI, so if there is really you know, a, a proof there, um, and there is a group of member states in Europe who view this increasingly skeptical, who are, are saying, we're not so sure about this, um, then we've been, finding, um, that we've been finding it very challenging to even get a, a rough estimate what the impact would be, how much it would cost to create an ecosystem of trust. Um, for instance, taking this example from before, what's the additional cost of um, training your AI algorithm um, with European data if you're a startup coming from the US to the EU? Um, that's really hard to, to get a grasp on. Um, um, so what we'd say again is if we can't project the costs right now, we need to be extra careful that we're not putting a stick in the wheel of AI development. Um, third thought would be, um, as I mentioned before, classifying low and high risk AI is very black and white. And the reality is, of course, it's a lot more nuanced and many businesses might be operating on the fringes of this or startups might not know at the outset where their innovation is taking them. So, so our position is that we want the commission to put forward a pathway for any startup to scale, regardless of whether they're building high or low risk uh, uh, AI uh, products or services. And we want to avoid businesses skirting around the, the definition of high risk or moving to other geographies when they believe um, they'll meet the definition of high risk. Um, in terms of timeline, um, we have the white paper now. The commission is looking at AI legislation right now. I think we'll probably see something early of next year. Um, there are really relevant related files coming out soon. Um, I mentioned the Data Governance Act, which is coming up next week. Um, and as Ambassador Froman said, things like data adequacy also play, of course, a massive role for the AI startups in our network. Um, let me close uh, with an optimistic note. Um, we are really, up, we are really uh, um, ambitious about the potential of startups. We've seen tons of startups pivot during COVID, and this includes AI startups. Um, I don't think that uh, uh, you know, any other sector could be as agile as the startups uh, to, to um, react to current challenges. Um, we see similar data uh, for startups being founded in Europe as in the US, just see, still see a big lag when it comes to scale-ups and big exits. And, and um, I think a part of this is just a function of time um, because Silicon Valley got out of the gates quicker. Um, so I think we, we need to give the, the, the startups in our ecosystem the time to, um, to scale up. And you know, as we say in, in, in German, grass doesn't grow faster if you pull on it. So let's make sure not to um, um, put any obstacles in the way of the AI startups. I hope this gave a first flavor of the AI legislation coming. Um, thanks for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you. We already have some good questions piling up here, but let's go on with our panel first. Uh, Eliana, you're next. Hi. Um, I think there's a bit of background noise coming from the street. If it becomes too loud, let me know. And I and I will shorten my presentation and, and leave more for the discussion later and change place. So just flag it. If, um, but I mean, I, I would like to just um, touch some, the, introduce a little bit what we're seeing coming with respect to the DMA and the legislation on um, that is supposed to regulate uh, platforms uh, and address concerns of, uh, of market power and, 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 and other structural problems. So what do we see? We, I mean, we haven't seen the proposal, but we've seen enough of it that we have, uh, or we've seen enough leaks and, and discussions that what we see coming is a, um, a, a, legis a new legislative legislative instruments, so a new regulation that is a bit of a hybrid between a sector regulation and a case-by-case -case, uh, assessment. Uh, what it will do is that it will grant a new, a new regulatory authority or, or, or refurbished existing ones. So it will grant an authority the power to 
uh, a put a company in, co in scope of the regulation so you will be designated as being in scope of the regulation and impose uh, remedial actions uh, the remedial actions can be behavioral but they could also be structural uh, and they're meant to either correct uh, anti-competitive behavior uh, but also correct anti-competitive outcomes so we're departing a little bit from the concept of abuse uh, in the competition uh, that exists in the competition world. Uh, it's not only meant to correct, it all, it's also will be meant to prevent. That's the ex ante component. Uh, again, both with uh, potentially with behavior or structural uh, remedies. So it's, 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 it's an incredibly broad scope uh, of, of possible action. In addition to that, we'll see a, a new instrument, it will be like a market investigation formerly known as the new competition tool uh, that would allow, that is now part of this, this TMA instrument and uh, that will allow uh, the authorities to conduct sector-wide uh, investigation and potentially propose sector-wide interventions to again prevent, correct or prevent anti-competitive um, outcomes. Um, so we see uh, quite a few problematic aspects in this proposal. I mean, we haven't seen the proposal. We foresee there might be uh, quite a few problematic aspects in this proposal. So one of them is the, the scope. So um, clearly the noise is that US big tech will be in scope, uh, but it's very unclear who else or how the scope will objectively be defined. Uh, so there's discussions that is based on size. Uh, we know there's a, a departure from traditional concept of dominance. There's tradition uh, from traditional concept of market definition. Uh, so it's some kind of measure of economic uh, importance, but it's very unclear still what it's going to be. Um, the and, and and the risk here is that the, the, you get the feeling that the scope is defined to target specific companies as opposed to based on assessment of likelihood of objective um, issues. Uh, the assessment is uh, the other problematic um, issue. Uh, it's very unclear how or on what um, with. Uh, what the problem is that that the that the, um, that the regulators are trying to solve. Uh, so, first of all, the exempt component of this reg uh, regulation seems to be built on um, a lot of presumptions about how the market works that are not necessarily evidence, uh, backed by evidence. Uh, I like to say they, they, they're backed by repetition, <laughs> but they become true by repetition, but there's not always, the generalization is not always warranted, at least we think. Um, there's a, the issue that there, there's a lack of a requirement that there is an abusive conduct. So it's really becoming an intervention that is based on structural considerations. And so it's very unclear to see, so what is it that you're looking for? Are we looking for a particular market structure? Are we looking for uh, what structure is problematic and why? So how do you assess market outcomes? It's still very unclear beyond the fact that we have the feeling that it's just uh, a market structure that, uh, that is being sought after. And that brings me to uh, the last problem that we have. So it's not only the, the, uh, the, um, the scope and the assessment, but it's actually what is the actual objective of this regulation? Uh, is it user welfare? Is it innovation? Is it just a structural objective? And that's also very difficult uh, to tell. So we see a, a vague uh, framework with very concrete proposals of what kind of remedies uh, could be imposed, but what those remedies are, are, are going to achieve or are or, 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 or trying to achieve, what, how they're, uh, when they're going to be imposed, that is still very fuzzy uh, in terms of how would you represent that in, a, in an analytical framework? What is the analytical framework that would support that? Um, and so we think that the, any proposal at this stage seems a bit premature uh, in terms that the, the problems uh, are not well defined. Not well, we will see a proposal, but what we foresee is that there will be after the proposal on the table, there'll be a discussion about, okay, how do you implement that too? How do you uh, write guidelines, uh, implementation guidelines around it? What is, how do you build uh, the case precedence? That the real detail probably will come after uh, what might be a general test just granting 
uh, very, very wide powers to, to a regulator. So what is it that we would like to see in the process that we think will open with this proposal uh, that will come, I think, on December 2nd? That's what we expect the, the, the commission to publish the proposal. Um, so how, how, what we would like to see? Well, we would like to see the scope, uh, the, the, the criteria determining coming into scope be somewhat related to a likelihood of an impact, of a negative impact on the market or a negative effect. Uh, so we would like some uh, criteria that relate to either market dominance or economic importance for a significant number of players, uh, so, some, some criteria that relate to um, expected outcome uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a somewhat rigorous way. Uh, we would like to see clear standards for assessment, uh, so a proper definition of what are the objects, what's the benchmark of success, what, are, what is the you know, on competition, we have user welfare. What is here uh, what we're looking for? And a prin principle-based framework of analysis so that we, how do we distinguish a problematic behavior from an unproblematic behavior? Uh, we would like an evidence-based approach and not so much reliance on presumptions. Uh, there's a narrative about how this market, uh, how this platform space works. Uh, which is extremely simplified, simplistic, and uh, we believe doesn't represent uh, correctly the technology. So you know, concepts around tipping or envelopment are used very loosely. Uh, and so we would like to ground that on evidence a little bit more. Uh, we would like uh, not to see blacklisted or whitelisted behaviors. So strict prohibition or strict mandates without the possibility of an objective justification or an efficiency argument. Uh, we think that's particularly important given the complexity of the systems and also particularly because we see that the whole theme of value is absent from this debate. Uh, every, and you'll see all the reports and, and, and commentaries start by saying, yeah, this sector has produced a lot of value, uh, consumers have benefited, uh, but, and then the value process is completely lost in the assessment of the market structure, the, 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 the functioning of the market or the behaviors, the value never comes back. Uh, and so there's, it's like there's no production function, there's no value creation. Uh, and so we are concerned that uh, having abstracted from the value creation so much, the remedies actually um, harm this value process and hurt uh, both the user experience, the innovation and the product, the quality of the products that are um, out there. Uh, so, so having uh, inc reincorporating that and having the possibility to talk about the efficiency elements uh, is critical. Uh, and then, of course, there's principles of basic regulation, of good regulation, so proportionality. So remedies should, uh, should not go beyond what is strictly needed to resolve a particular problem or an issue. Uh, and then uh, we would like, and that has been mentioned before, ideally a consistent regime, uh, first across the EU, uh, and we'll see how the interplay between the European Commission and the, or the European white regulator or the uh, and the national member states, how that plays out. But we wouldn't want to see uh, a lot of discretion and, and fragmentation. So overall, we I mean, we acknowledge the concerns that that the disruption that um, digital platform has created has has prompted. I mean, there's some legitimate concerns. Uh, we don't believe they all should um, be solved with competition policies because we don't believe a lot, uh, many of them don't relate to abuse, they relate to change and transformation and the impact of that. But, and so we see with this uh, regulation uh, being uh, improperly defined, too discretionary and, uh, and lacking the basic principles that, that uh, contain um, regulatory action and give uh, legal certainty. Uh, so we see risks for Europe. Uh, we see risks for uh, in the European approach to big tech. Uh, but there's also a risk that even the Europeans see that. And so they decide to hyper target this legislation to just a few companies and not submit uh, uh, their own or other companies to the same regime. And that would be uh, obviously something that um, we would want to avoid. Uh, to be a bit of an, uh, the, the subject of an experiment. Okay. Uh, and so those are the, uh, those are my main comments. Uh, I'm happy to uh, expand or engage on them uh, during the discussion.
Okay, thank you. Let's uh, move on to Kai Uwe, who gets the prize for the best backdrop. Okay, yes. Well, <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Um, it's, it's actually a lot of the things that um, were just said by um, uh, Ileana uh, ring true to me as well, and I could probably uh, support them as well. Uh, but I, I think what I wanted to say here um, are a couple of comments that go more in the direction of, I think what we've heard before, namely the, the strong reliance that we used to have on a rules-based system and, and really the problems that we're going to have in competition policy from, from going away from that. And as Ileana has already said, uh, to a system potentially of much more discretion um, and presumptions. And, and I think presumptions in this context very often mean much more discretion. And kind of one of the comments I wanted to make at the start on this, though, because of I've, I've, uh, from some of the material of yours that I read, um, I, I'm concerned that some of the discussion that might come from the U.S. is something about uh, targeting U.S. companies um, and and uh, not targeting the Chinese and giving the Chinese advantages. I think that actually misses what is going on in the discussion. Uh, and diverts the attention away from much more fundamental issues that we're going to have in the regime um, that I think um, Ileana was actually pointing to, but, but that I would like to stress. There is, of course, one aspect to this, which is um, uh, policy, industrial policy concerns about uh, European tech lagging behind both the US and China. I think that's seen as fairly symmetrically. It's seen as those countries actually having done something for their tech and Europe hasn't. And there is this policy perception that you need to create space for the companies to actually develop. Um, and uh, if you have the large tech companies and those who are active in Europe at the moment are mostly the Americans, but it would also uh, be the case if now the Chinese would come in more strongly, uh, you would have to protect the uh, European ecosphere, so to speak, from that, and that is the only way of developing an own tech industry. I think that's kind of the, the, the philosophy behind, behind that. I do want to talk more about um, the competition uh, policy angle here, because I think there's also um, a large change here that is a return to um, kind of a much simpler regime where intervention is easier as kind of in older times in which we had uh, lots of um, presumptions and per se uh, illegality. And uh, it's really interesting to see how kind of some of the rules changes that we're seeing are actually pushed particularly by those jurisdictions who were never very happy uh, with a very strong effects-based approach. Uh, for example, Germany. And uh, I think one of the things where, where I would want to go back to really where we have a change and now a change back, just as an, as an example, is the whole debate about uh, the GE Honeywell case, which, which unfortunately in the US was coined as a difference between Europeans protecting competitors and Americans uh, protecting competition. That was really not what the case was about. The case was about uh, procedure and evidence and was really mostly overturned by the European court. And I was involved in this. I, I, I worked for, uh, testified for Honeywell at the European court, um, was overturned on the basis of such enormously sloppy use of evidence and not actually going into the functioning of the industry. Um, the issue there was that there wasn't a really good reason for the merger and, and the parties couldn't tell. So it, it wasn't a problem uh, kind of of um, kind of not thinking about the competition in the market. I think people were. It was a question of a lack of procedure uh, where you would go back and check whether you actually were, uh, in terms of the evidence, in a space in which you could really say that there were going to be competitive effects or not. And that caused quite a fundamental reform in terms of not separating decision powers and investigative powers, uh, but trying to go in that direction by creating checks and balances, which for, for many years, uh, still when I was at the commission, were actually very effective in holding people back. And, but when I was at the commission, 
people were starting to chafe at uh, these checks and balances, basically saying, well, we know that there are problems and you're just not letting us intervene uh, because you want, all, you want to have all this evidence. Um, this issue has become a lot stronger um, and always becomes a lot stronger when you're going in the direction of markets that are really difficult to understand that are complex. And therefore the high tech industry has been one of those targets in which people have said, look, we know that there's something wrong. Secondly, we have complaints and we have to get out from under the restrictions that we're seeing that come uh, from a strong evidence-based approach. Um, and so that's the push in the direction of presumptions and the push in the direction of needing less evidence in order to intervene. Uh, you've seen it before in proposals of saying, uh, we actually, maybe for the high tech companies or maybe for others, we should actually reverse the burden of proof in mergers. And despite the fact that we don't have any new legislation, if you've been involved in mergers lately at, at the commission, there is a creeping tendencies towards actually reversing the burden of proof in those cases, where, where previously you kind of had examples where you said, well, the commission has to prove that. They basically say, well, we believe it's a problem, prove the opposite. And this has been a process that has been going on over time. And I think that's really important in order to understand where some of these ex ante instruments are actually coming from. They're coming from the fact that proving things appear very burdensome, that people believe that there are problems, that it takes too long to fix the problems ex post, and therefore you need to intervene ex ante without the restrictions of actually having to prove something. Um, and you see how that works with the German proposals that I think are going to be adopted uh, very soon at the beginning of next week, uh, next year, but where the logic has already been applied in merger cases, for example, in Europe, not for the big high tech companies, but uh, for uh, online ticketing, for an online ticketing merger that was prohibited. And there the argument goes a little bit like this, uh, and it's a pseudo-economic argument, uh, really, where they say, oh, this is a platform. We know platforms have network effects. Markets with network effects tend to tip. Therefore, they will tip. Uh, any strength of, the, of market power is going to uh, lead to more tipping. And then we're going to look at criteria that make that worse, namely data is important. Financial strength is important. And then you're leading to a description uh, that fits very much of the large tech companies. And the ex ante intervention instrument, uh, very similar to what is now contemplated at the EU level, is kind of one where you're designating a couple of companies as being important for competition across markets. And then you list these things like platform network effects, financial strength, data, and then you prohibit certain behaviors on that basis, uh, including essentially, and I'm not sure whether that's cleared up yet, but including something like entering into a, a new market uh, that you would then roll up and make it impossible for other people to enter. So I think the point here is that we are getting into a situation very much like Eliana said, where we haven't really analyzed markets and what's happening in them and actually looking at different companies that do very different things and work in different markets because they're high, high tech from, uh, from exactly the same perspective uh, with terms that are actually very imprecise and with questions about who is going to check and what are going to be the standards of enforcement in those cases. Um, I think that's really the key issue. Um, I, I think one has to accept that we're going to get some regulation in these areas. One has to accept that, it, that one is going to get some ex ante regulation in the area. And I think really the problems and the issues that are going to arise is, are we going to get a system in which firms can defend themselves, in which evidence can be brought, and actually the question of how you're dealing with efficiency uh, uh, defenses because in the current regime and what happens in a lot of also national uh, competition authorities 
is that when you come up with an efficiency, the answer is we hear you, but we don't believe it and you're not meeting the standard of proof. So what we have had a tendency is to increase the standards of proof for efficiencies, decrease the standards of proof for intervention, and therefore leading to a subjective assessment and competition authorities, whether they're gonna believe what you're saying or not going to believe what you're saying. And we've seen this in tech cases, we've, I've seen this in quite a few tech cases at the, at the German competition authority. And it is kind of uh, an assessment by gut feeling uh, whether you're gonna get commitment or prohibition decisions and, and what is actually intervened against. And I think that loss of process uh, should be really the first target when talking about what institute, what kind of reform should actually come about. Um, I think that was, that used to be kind of the, the great achievements that we had over the years in competition policy uh, through uh, different, like the International Competition Network, the European Competition Network, uh, the degree to which um, kind of the, the agencies uh, talk to each other. All that was in a way of, of kind of improving pro a process. But I think here we don't have this anymore. The question is who's taking these decisions? Is there a checks and balance in terms of the decision taking? Uh, should we push in that type of framework towards more of a separation between uh, investigation and decision making powers? Are we going to have review processes for the regulations uh, where there are obligations like we had in the last state aid guidelines at Europe, obligations to an ex post analysis of what the effects of these regulations were? Uh, what is the role of reviewing courts of decisions? I think all of those things are, are unclear. And given the political framework that we're seeing and the push towards doing something without thinking through the institutional framework. I think there, the first intervention point really has to be to push for a clear uh, institutional framework that actually allows some evidence to be heard and decisions to be reviewed. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, let's uh, go to Kadi, uh, finish us up here. We'll go, to, I can tell you, we've already got some very good questions. So I wanna make sure we have time for those. So Kadi, go ahead. Very good. Well, thanks very much. And thank you all for joining. Um, fantastic panel. Very little to add. Uh, I guess I'll just uh, take a step back uh, from the, the dialogue uh, to emphasize the importance of the US-EU uh, economic relationship and transatlantic digital uh, relationship as well. Um, as, we, as we know, in just B2C e-commerce that has exploded during the COVID times, Majorities of European shop on US marketplaces, um, majorities of European companies also that are uh, producers of say manufactured products, import uh, services, digitally enabled services from the um, uh, United States and um, US digital services are very integrated in European supply chains, uh, about 53% uh, of U.S. digitally deliverable services go into um, B2B uh, purposes, basically for, for European supply chains and production. So the, the relationship is very important. It's important for the United States and Europe uh, uh, has in the United States a key partner for uh, digital services as well as for uh, products that are sold online uh, every day across the Atlantic. At the same time, we've seen in the past number of years, these challenges of uh, new regulations from Europe, the GDPR, the copyright um, uh, law that went into effect in 2018, that kind of undermined safe harbors, uh, digital services, taxes, uh, and now we have these proposals on AI and competition policy um, and so on. And these are of course, uh, you know, big challenges we had a chance to work on these um, competition policy issues uh, these past couple of months under this project. And I guess I'll just echo uh, Kai Uwe in, in saying that what we learned in this process was that there seemed to be a kind of pressure uh, on regulators, particularly in Europe, but also globally more broadly to do something about kind of big tech, part of that motivated by tech clash and these populist pressures and 
um, uh, about uh, particularly privacy protections uh, online. Part of it motivated by the uh, pressure by local less digitized companies to to uh, protect themselves against the competition um, uh, brought by uh, digital uh, giants, if you will. The the second motivation that we found was that you know Europe is concerned that U.S. companies, as they are expanding uh, their reach uh, beyond search and e-commerce and social networking, are kind of going into European swim lanes of of finance and banking, health, uh, transport, logistics, uh, and things like that. And there's a there's a concern that um, uh, Europe is losing. Um, its role in some of these markets also because of um, uh, technology companies uh, coming into these spaces. And of course, there are those, these concerns with China and Chinese expansion in, um, in technology um, and Chinese uh, particular model of state-backed uh, enterprises. So th these were perhaps some of the, the key elements that, that we learned about. At the same time, what we learned is that precisely to Ileana's point, is there is practically no empirical evidence for many of those uh, concerns and uh, uh, documents that have been floated in, in Europe and, and kind of repeatedly uh, discussed about uh, big tech undermining consumer welfare or competition or innovation. Simply, you, you just don't find um, you know, very solid empirical evidence for any of that. Um, or for these assertions that you know networks, digital networks are getting very large and entrenched and um, uh, uh, and, and kind of durable. That these winner-take-all dynamics are are um, are there, and um, uh, and and that um, uh, there are um, uh, dynamics that undermine uh, consumer welfare. So I was actually shocked by the lack of empirical evidence behind some of the European proposals. When you read the policy documents and, and then you look at the empirical uh, evidence. And what the concern that I have personally is that some of these uh, proposals that you see out there are actually counterproductive to Europe itself, as, as Benedict and Kai Uwe also uh, discussed, is that you know, they, they undermine uh, startup, you know, uh, startup and kind of scale up um, you know, growth in Europe. If you make it harder for companies to exit and merge, uh, certainly you undermine investor incentives to invest in uh, uh, small businesses or, or provide growth capital to companies. This is already a concern in Europe where companies are leaving uh, to come to the US to, to seek capital once they get to a scale up phase. And um, uh, I don't see that the competition policy proposals do anything to, to uh, uh, change that. To the contrary, um, there is also this uh, you know, concern about US companies coming to European uh, markets of kind of traditional uh, markets of finance and health and so forth. Uh, at the same time, if we target US companies, that doesn't mean that European companies will, will thrive in these spaces necessarily. And uh, we've discussed China and you know, China is, is um, also out there um, yeah, in this in these spaces. There are other uh, countries bit by bit, and um, the and then the the third uh, concern that I have is that this will simply um, these proposals will simply kind of under, undermine innovation. It is large business uh, empirically that invests um, and innovates and and invests most capital uh, in um, R and D. And gets most out of uh, R&D dollars as well. Uh, big companies in the United States, uh, the big technology companies, are are critical in investing in artificial intelligence uh, applications that then are used by, say, for national security purposes. And uh, they are absolutely critical, and they they are able to invest because of their uh, size. Um, uh, and uh, and these are also uh, very important issues for for Europe. So. You know the, the proposals that we saw on the table uh, to me are concerning in that they you know seem to kind of undermine Europe's Europe's interest in entrepreneurship um, uh, and innovation and really do nothing in particular to build uh, Europe's own technology leadership. So a couple of ideas that we we uh, put on the table and I conclude with this is one is to use kind of innovation as the as one of the tests of, for antitrust. Typically, uh, in the U.S., um, uh, antitrust uh, 
uh, the, the key test for antitrust has been consumer welfare in Europe. There's also kind of competition and how many players there are in a given market. Uh, but uh, neither side has really applied uh, an innovation to the extent that it could be applied to to test uh, as a as a test for for antitrust um, when innovation is key clearly for uh, creating new value for consumers and and enabling uh, technology ecosystems and so forth. So. That was one of the uh, thoughts that emerged from uh, working groups and, and discussions. The second is to, for the United States also to work with the smaller European countries, the so-called D9 economies, the Nordics, the, the Estonias, the Ireland, um, and um, uh, a number of others to uh, further this more constructive, uh, more liberal, if you will, uh, technology agenda. Uh, of course, you know, we, we need to find better ways also to work with China, uh, on, on China, uh, uh, together with Europe. And finally, on Kai Uwe's point, uh, kind of bring the empirical evidence back to uh, uh, antitrust or these discussions. Could we, could we perhaps create more of a transatlantic brain trust that um, uh, discusses uh, uh, these cases in a more objective fashion? And, um, and also incorporate some of the kind of people from Benedict's world uh, who are in the, in the business of helping startups and scale-ups uh, grow and, uh, and um, have kind of almost a shadow cabinet, if you will, of uh, wise men and women who, who look at this with um, these uh, proposals and these cases with objective eyes and uh, uh, promote a much more evidence-based uh, antitrust uh, activity. So, I'll conclude with that, Bill. Thank you. That's a good, uh, good discussion, a good summary of, of our work on the competition policy. As I said, questions are, are piling up. If you want to have another question and haven't sent us one, you can use the Q&A function or the chat function to uh, submit it, and I monitor it. But it, let's begin by turning it over to Meredith, who has really been the, the guiding force of this project and the author of several of the, of the papers. And let me ask her to start off with a few questions of your own, and then uh, uh, I'll come back and, and ask the, uh, the audience questions in a few minutes. Meredith, go ahead. Thanks, Bill. A lot of similarities between the discussion in the DSA uh, context and then also in competition policy. You know, a lot of the same problems are being articulated and, and frustration is, is evident. Um, I'd like to talk to Benedict a little bit more about the, the good things that are going on in Europe in terms of the tech ecosystem there and what is really happening that we need to protect and not uh, do any uh, further damage to until we have some more evidence. Um, I, you know, I noticed that, that there's uh, 174 European tech companies that are over a billion dollars in capitalization. Many of these firms survive in this online world and get access to consumers and, and software and data analytics from partner online platforms, both European and, and US. And I think we need to be very careful about going down and really hurting something that's actually flourishing, it's not flourishing as much as Europe wants and Europe can, can, uh, can see it's probably not uh, growing as fast as the US in this area, but uh, you don't want to uh, damage what is working. So Benedict, could you talk a little bit about the relationship between the smaller firms and the online firms, the bigger ones that seem to be the target of this? Sure, um, and I think you, you're, you teed it up very well. Um, I think we've seen tech ecosystems spawn really across Europe and um, also levels of maturity uh, uh, coming around in, in not just London, but you know, uh, uh, Paris and Berlin are also mentioned, but really um, um, across the continent and, and um, on, a, on a kind of per capita level, the amounts of startups we see are similar to the, the levels in the US. Uh, the point I mentioned earlier about there not being enough scale-ups and, and uh, really big exits is a part of, I think, not, they're not being maturity and this is a function of time on the one hand. And um, I also think there's, of course, things that can be done in, in terms of completing a digital single market um, um, or uh, unleashing more capital um, to the market to, to improve that. Um, I think um, just kind of going to the, the second part of your question, um, 
there is actually, yeah, there is an interdependence, absolutely, um, between the businesses, the startup scale ups, and the, uh, the big players. And um, we are still in the process of, of finalizing our position on the Digital Markets Act, but um, we are absolutely of the opinion that it's going to be very hard to target big players without there being uh, uh, indirect effects on the startups that produce apps, on the startups that sell on these big platforms or find customers with advertisements uh, from these big platforms. So that to us also is, a, is an open question that we haven't seen sufficiently uh, addressed at, at this point. Good, thank you. And in terms of the uptake of AI, which is a goal of the commission, um, in terms of getting more firms digitized in Europe um, and allowing uh, companies to adopt this technology. Benek, what do you see as the biggest concern that you have in terms of, of, of potentially tamping that down? I think, you know, I mean, we come at this from the position that a, a, a startup is really only a good idea and a great data set away from, you know, potentially being the next unicorn. And when it comes to kind of data sets, I think we've, you know, we've talked about this already a bit. Um, getting, you know, a lot of data is really important if you're an AI uh, as a developer and getting high quality data is, is really important. So, so there is this, there has been this idea floating around um, that um, AI algorithms in the EU should be trained on European data. Um, and that's something we are uh, absolutely not agreeing with. Um, the, one of the kind of examples that's given a lot is that, hey, you know, if there's an AI algorithm coming from the US uh, for self-driving cars, um, you know, in America, you guys, you have big roads, they're designed for uh, cars. Uh, this can't work uh, in small European medieval cities um, um, where a self-driving car just wouldn't be able to cope. Um, that's kind of the narrative and example we've heard uh, around this. But of course, you know, all, I think everybody in attendance can immediately think of an example or two why this, uh, where this kind of example doesn't really work out. If you think of a AI um, health startup, for instance, uh, we've spoken to one called Corti AI, which recognizes if folks are having um, um, a, a cardiac arrest on emergency lines, and this is trained by you know by by data. Um, um, from from folks around the world, and you know, the sound of somebody having a, a cardiac arrest isn't necessarily different in the U.S. versus uh, in, in Europe. So there, of course, we need more data, and and so so this idea that um, training data on European uh, training AI on European data is one I think is particularly worrying. Um, um, if I was to point point my finger on one. Great, thank you, uh, Caillou. Um, can you talk a little bit about all the what are the institutional options that might come out of all of this process on the Digital Services Act, the Digital Market Act, and new innovations and in competition policy? What, what do you think the structure is that's under consideration and how different will it be? Okay, uh, I'm actually very unsure about this. Um, I. Um, because it's also kind of been shifting so much. Um, there are now kind of some pressures to follow somewhat of the, the German model and so on, but, but it's, it's, it's just very, very hard to tell. I, I think uh, there's probably going to be, I, I would be expecting that there's something like this uh, uh, market investigation instrument that Ileana to, uh, told about that's gonna come out. Um, that seems very attractive, I think, to to DG Comp, uh, it has a model from from the from the UK, uh, which the CMA has it. Um, for me, that's concerning because it it uh, it builds on a notion, a very vague notion of the market not functioning well, um, and has the benefit to the authority that they can intervene when they find this. Uh, but at the same time, and very broadly, and make policy proposals. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the evidentiary standards are much lower than on any antitrust case that, that you would have had. So, so basically, a possibility to investigate and then make proposals of, of large interventions. Uh, I, I think that's worrying because of the, 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 the process. But I think I, I would be surprised if we wouldn't get an instrument of that type. So this would be uh, just to clarify, this would be a commission instrument that would. I be think this would be a commission, uh, probably that that would probably be a DG comp instrument. 
um, on, on the regulatory ex ante intervention side, um, I, I'm just not quite sure how they how they want to want to do it. Um, I, I, I think the signs are more and more that we're going to get in ex ante instrument, uh, whether it's going to be called a regulatory instrument or a competition instrument. Um, I'm, I'm unsure about. Yeah, I was confused. Um, yeah, I, I, I find I, I find it really confusing. I think it, it also I, I think we cannot know. I think there's going to be a, a, a lot of pulling back and forth. Um, I think even in the commission, there are some people who are more for and who are more against. Um, I'm almost hoping for something that's a bit more regulatory because then the framework is clear and the scope for um, discretion is going to be smaller potentially. I, I think that might actually be easier to work with uh, than something that has uh, very large discretionary possibilities. Um, and so that would be more on the regular, pushing more on the regulatory side than, than on the comp side. Uh, but I, I think it's going to be some kind of a description of platforms, digit, uh, digital network effects, um, and then kind of a list of behaviors that then aren't allowed, including uh, self-preferencing. Um, well, well, that even in the commission, that's not controversial, but I, I think we're not going to get around that. I mean, even, even within DG Comp, there are a lot of people who think that self-preferencing isn't a problem in every case and that there are cases where there are no competition issues and that there are cases where there are competition issues. Uh, but I think we're going to see on that side a, a, a per se rule I would be expecting uh, because I think it's anything else is gonna be not acceptable within the discussions, not even between the countries, but also between the competition authorities. Okay. Bill, I can see you've got good questions there. I, I do, let me get through a couple, few of these and we, if we have time, we'll come back to you, Meredith. First one is for Benedict um, and it's uh, across regions, AI rules have many, oh, you've seen this Benedict because you said you wanted to answer it. Uh, AI rules have many parts in common. Does the panel think that the US and the EU can make bilateral progress to develop AI rules that can in turn be developed with China to ultimately agree on a set of global rules? I think um, also to the point of, of Kai Uwe before, um, the, there's real appetite to do something on AI right now in Europe. And I can't speak for uh, uh, whether this appetite is requited uh, or also present present in the US to the same extent. So, um, and I guess a lot will depend on, on, you know, how a new administration in the US formulates its AI priorities and I can't speak to that. Um, but, you know, I think the ball is rolling in the EU. Um, so, um, you know, there would be kind of, a, that would be time sensitive um, to make that happen. Um, I also, you know, on the, on the issue itself, you know, thinking back to GDPR, where there was, you know, a big push on, for privacy in Europe, and which I think is now more felt in the US. Um, I also don't see that there is maybe that the conversation is at this at the same level already um, um, as it is in, in, in Europe. Um, and, and who's to say if, if, if we're getting it right by already going ahead uh, with AI legislation or not. But I I right now, of course, yes, hypothetically, it's possible, but I would doubt it because the EU is just on a train already. Well, while we're on China, let me go to another one then. Um, do you think that the recent drafts and amendments published by Chinese authorities with regard to competition law and digital markets can be interpreted as an effort by China to align with the European digital regulation? Do you see a regulatory convergence toward one legal order Maybe China embracing a stricter approach to data processing to comply with international requirements. Anybody want to take that one on? I don't see a lot of volunteers. I think it's a competition question uh, in that way. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to take a pass. You mean regulatory competition? <laughs> well, I, I, I would, I find it strange that kind of China would do something unilateral that's, that's, that's just adjusting. And um, I, I, 
I'm not sure they're they're feeling that pressure at the moment. Um, I, I think it's an opportunity for them to to increase intervention possibilities that look like they're similar to what is being contemplated in the West, and that's always good because it's easier to justify. Um, but you know, I, I I don't think they're going to be less discretional discretional than they've they've already been. So. No, I think I, I, I would answer this. I think the idea of convergence uh, right now with current Chinese policy is very unlikely. They're moving in a different direction. And I think the current leadership is going to continue to move in that direction. Uh, but let's come back to Europe for a minute. Now, this is probably one that, that Benedict will want to answer, but it's directed to everybody. How can we ensure that regulatory moves in Europe facilitate the development of indigenous startups rather than opening the playing field to Chinese players who are clearly further ahead. A lot of our questioners are really focused on China, I guess. <laughs> Benedict, do you want to give that a try? Yeah, I mean, I think what we say as an organization a lot uh, when we speak to policymakers is really try and um, get to know two or three startups in your uh, in your constituency before thinking of the big uh, players who you want to maybe uh, cut ahead shorter to 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 make the startups grow. That's not really how it works. So, so. Um, when we um, think about um, things we could do, I think completing the digital single market um, is, I think, at the forefront. Um, the digital single market was really initially targeted at um, improving cross-border trade in Europe, and I don't see us um, all the way there yet. Um, when it comes to um, um, kind of policy in the pipeline, what we're really enthusiastic about, I'll just plug this, is the Startup Nation Standard. It's part of the Commission's SME strategy. I would keep an eye out for that because that's going to be for for us a really exciting one. Um, essentially, what this will be is going it's going to be the Commission putting forward a set of best practices for member states to implement to be startup nations. This includes things like reformed startup visas, stock option reform, which many of our ecosystems are um, complaining about, having not as attractive stock option schemes as the US, for instance. Um, so, so there will be more coming here. I think the, the EU leadership is waking up increasingly um, to kind of the policy instruments it has at its supposed, at disposal. Can I, can, I, can I quickly jump on that one? Because I think that, you know, I don't know how many programs I've seen for start, startups in Europe over the last, I don't know how many years. Uh, my question is like, I, I'm not sure that's really what Europe wants to do. If you look at their big digitalization strategy, it's not about startups as it is about the digital transformation of their big digital, of their big players and their big industry. Uh, so I think they're more concerned about guaranteeing a space for their for their large established companies than they are about generating a new generation of uh, of, uh, of startups. Uh, the two things that you need that you can easily do for startups they, they've never done. Uh, which is, you know, fixed public procurement. So it favors uh, small new firms and spend your R&D money in a way that favors uh, small new firms. And that, that's not really how R&D or public procurement works uh, in Europe. Uh, so for me, until that's not tackled, I'm not sure. I, I, I remain skeptical about all those initiatives and, and, and goodwill just because I've seen so many of them. Uh, but if you look at their big projects, Gaia X, or, or their big sectoral initiatives in health, mobility, uh, those are the big players. Th that's what they're really trying, they're, they're focusing on. And so uh, I think that that's really the objective that they have in mind is how do you ensure successful digital transition of our big players? Eliana, um, what are you thinking about in terms of if uh, you talked about the Digital Services Act and the concerns, but if you were going to do open up with a, a blank piece of paper, what could be done in Europe to increase innovation and entrepreneurship and scaling up the platforms uh, that Europe says they want to do? What are the best policies in your experience? I mean, again, um, our, I mean, honestly, in, in general, I think public procurement and R&D and powerful instruments, that's what's used in the US to a very large extent. Uh, there's, and then there's pressure, right? I mean, Europe has been extremely reactive to the digital, to, to digital technology and internet-based business from the beginning. They've been very defensive about it uh, with content, with e-commerce, with uh, 
I mean, you name se sector after sector, mobility, Uber, a sector after sector, it was about containment. Uh, and, and I think it's this, um, they would have to embrace the notion that maybe their companies are gonna change. It's very hard to <laughs> sell that as a proposition, but, but, uh, but it, well, then it's, it's pressure because it, it requires such a big transformation to be really high performant in, in the digital space, right? You have to change the way the organization works. Uh, that's something organizations in Europe because they're very old and they're very, uh, somewhat very, um, I don't say ossified because it's too pejorative, but they're very structured. Uh, they're having a hard time uh, even internally rearranging to, 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 so that they're more nimble and more flexible and, and, and more apt for that kind of technology. So, so those are very deep issues. Uh, but, I, but I think- the, the pressure yeah. of the market is always healthy, I think. <laughs> but, but that's what they're trying to avoid. No, but, but I think it's also an issue that we know something about. Uh, so, so for example, uh, when we were looking, when we were reforming uh, state aid rules um, and, and you look at the empirical literature, it's very clear where R&D subsidies work are with small firms. They're not working with large firms. The, the, the R&D subsidies with large firms are pocketed and don't really have innovation effects. And, and, and that reform tried to stop that, but, but of course, against a lot of resistance that there, there are lots of ways of, of helping your large firms. And so I think, think, I, I think Ileana is right there. It's, it's, we, we have a situation in which you want to show as governments that you have an impact. Uh, that seems to look much easier when you're going towards large projects. And that's why there's a bias towards that because they're much better advertising for, for government uh, outcomes. Because if you're, if you're trying to kind of incentivize that sphere of the smaller companies, uh, that's gonna take time to actually show real impact. And, and I think that's kind of where the bias is. And if you're trying to, to kind of uh, scale up and compete in that uh, area and are worried about competitiveness, you're gonna do it with big uh, players that basically say, here are the things that you can support, uh, that we can put out the market and therefore do this. And, and that's, that's where the pushes have been um, in long discussions over the years on supporting key technologies. Um, and where I think the economic advice has never gone very much in that direction, but, but politically that's, that's what has won out. And, and so I, I agree there with Eliana that that's, uh, that's a fundamental issue in that context. I think there's one other thing, and that also has to do do with legal framework. And I think kind of Uber is one of those one of those examples, um, which is partly when you're doing something that's kind of new, doesn't quite fit into the legal framework that you had before. The preferred legal instrument of European courts is an injunction to stop it. Uh, while in the U.S., it may actually be more something about damages or coming to an arrangement uh, and, and and building kind of new frameworks. And I think there, the, the very rigidity of, of some of the legal instruments actually mean that it's very hard uh, to do something that breaks the mold in one way or another. And so partly the legal framework also makes it much, much more difficult uh, because you're, you're just facing greater risks as a, as, a, as a startup that does new things. Can I, I just yeah, quick... Uh, can I add an example, maybe to to underline the potential? I mean, there's. I think it's it's you know quite well except for we know that, for instance, on fintechs, Europe has been actually you know at the forefront. You know, thinking of Klarna, Revolut, N26, Monzo. There's been a lot of fintechs uh, coming out of Europe, and many would say that you know the fact that we have a European banking license and we're quite harmonized here has played a big role, um, you know, in the US the system is also a lot still on a state basis. So, uh, and another big vertical where, where Europeans are doing quite well is for instance, when it comes to all these gaming apps. Um, so, so I think that that just underlines the points that Kaiuva and Liana was making, were making that, you know, it, it doesn't take much kind of regulatory tweaking, uh, but there's a lot under the surface. Okay, we've got, there's a couple of questions left, but we really don't have, don't have time. And the next one, which was the, the real reasons for Europe's failure to produce global digital companies. I think that's probably, uh, unless somebody has 
30 seconds on why Europe hasn't produced uh, global digital companies. I think I'm gonna turn it back to Meredith on, uh, for a final comment. Anybody want to do 30 seconds on that? It's more of a book actually. Okay, Meredith, uh, this has been extraordinarily interesting and very helpful for me. I learned a lot. You want to wrap it up with uh, any concluding comments or a concluding question? Take your pick. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I really appreciate our panelists participating. It's a very dense areas of regulation and uh, we in the U.S. are trying to, to get ourselves educated and understand what the goals are and really try to, to push a little harder on what, what is the empirical evidence? How do they know some of these uh, sort of reflexive, uh, very interventionist regulatory policies will work. And I would look forward to, to a time when Europe and, and the U.S. could talk a little bit more about how they're thinking about this new area of competition policy regulation. And, uh, and I think there should be you know, further exchanges in the future. So I just appreciate all of the thought you guys have given to, to your work and your interventions here, and you've really helped educate us and we still have more work to do. So we, we appreciate and it. I would add my thanks to the panel uh, for uh, good, uh, a good discussion, good thoughts. To our audience, I encourage you to take a look at the papers because uh, uh, we have, uh, we've done a good bit of uh, research and have a number of recommendations. Cotty mentioned several of them, but there are more. Uh, and you haven't heard the last uh, from us on this. I think as the situation in, in Europe develops, we'll probably be doing more and we'll look forward to talking with all of you again. And with that, I'll say thank you to everybody for participating, particularly the panelists, and goodbye. <laughs>